Last June, uh, we were at Keji for a few days. We had a little bit of a family retreat there. And uh, when we were camping, uh, Ryan had decided to take with him. We let the kids kind of take a little suitcase full of stuff, whatever they wanted from home. And uh, in their suitcases, some of them, you know, Ryan and Emma both packed stuffies or toys or different things, coloring books, etc. cetera. Um, one of the things that Ryan packed to take with him was this little, it's only about this tall, um, stuffy of Buzz Lightyear, okay? And, and it's a stuffy, uh, just a small one uh, that, that I bought for him when we were going on the boys camping trip a few years back, even before that. Um, and so Carolyn and Emma decided to go to Disney and we went to Keji for a few days. Um, and so, <laughs> and so uh, we can talk more about that later. Um, not that we're, I'm bitter about it or anything at all. Um, <laughs> But so, so I bought him this little buzz stuffy because, you know, this, this is going to be a cool thing. And he picked it out and we were together. You remember this, bud? Maybe? Yeah. And he's got this little buzz stuffy and we had it camping and he's had it ever since. He was two. Um, he just turned two when he got it. And it was this cool thing and this great thing. Well, when we were camping this June, he had taken it with him. And we were on our, I think it was the second to last day or the day before we were coming home. And Ryan decided to take his stuffy to the playground. And uh, he and Emma went and, you know, we had told the kids, if you take something to the playground, you have to hang on to it and make sure it comes back. Well, we went to the playground and later on we came back and a little later on, guess what we couldn't find? We couldn't, the buzz stuffy, that's right. We couldn't find the buzz stuffy. And we said, "Uh uh-oh, where is it? You know, I'll go back and I'll help you look for it. And Ryan was pretty torn up about this. And then was like, well, we can find this, you know, we can do this. And I'm, I'm like, you know, because, you know, there's just that part of me as a dad that's like, I bought that for him, and it was this kind of thing between us, and, you know, whatever, and I know it's just a little, it was the day we were going home, is that when it was? Yes, okay, so my memory's a little fuzzy. He, maybe, yeah, he could probably tell the story better than me. Um, so, so we were, so we've been looking all over for this. We went to the playground. And you think we could find it? Nope. Um, and you might have even seen if you were back home, Carolyn actually posted on Facebook on the Friends of Keji thing, like, hey, I know this is a long shot, but if you're around Keji this weekend, like, have, if you've seen this or you picked it up because you thought somebody might have lost it if you turned it into the visitor center or something, like, just, just let us know because we'd like to have it back and, you know, whatever. And anyway, we couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. Anyway, the, we were packing up to leave and, you know, uh, there's, there's been a few little tears along the way here and um, just... And for raw honesty's sake, I was one of the ones who had the few little tears because um, this was a special thing. And I know it's just a thing and I probably paid $3 for it, right? But like this was a, a memory is attached to uh, an important memory that we shared. And so anyway, so we couldn't find it and there was just, it was nowhere to be found until... I was packing up the camper and I had, you know, with one of those 10 foot pop up, you know, and the top goes up, right? And Bud likes to listen to those as people come to the campground just in case, you know, when you hear that, I'm just waiting for the day that breaks and snaps and then I don't know what I'm going to do. But anyway, so, so I'm putting, putting the sides down and I look under the camper and guess what I found wedged under the bed in between the camper? Buzz. Buzz hadn't actually gone to the playground. The memory was fuzzy. Buzz had been wedged underneath the camper and we found it and there was great rejoicing over that moment, okay? And both on his part, but on mine as well. I'm not sure who was more excited. Anyway, all that to say, you know what it's like to lose things, don't you? Some of you have lost things before that are very important to you, maybe some things that don't really matter, uh, but we've all lost things, whether the thing has fallen out of a pocket, right, uh, onto the ground or under the seat of your car and you have no idea where it is, but it fell out of somewhere, or maybe it got cut off or broke off and drifted away, right, in the ocean. Maybe that's happened to you before. Uh, Maybe you got lost because you took a wrong turn and refused to look up directions on your phone or wherever else, and you ended up getting more lost along the way. Maybe that's uh, you yourself got lost, or maybe sometimes, for some of us, we got lost on purpose because we decided we were going to walk away from them or the thing or the organization or the whatever. And and at the moment, we might not have said that we were going to get lost, but we were just walking away. And, and, And we find ourselves in this space where we're no longer with the group. Well, Jesus told stories about lost things 
In fact, in Luke 15, he tells three stories about lost things, all to the same point, but the lost things are things that in his stories end up actually being found. So, so what is it that prompted Jesus to tell these stories? Because most of the time when Jesus tells a story or a parable, it's prompted out of a particular circumstance or situation. And this one in particular, these three successive stories that Jesus th- tells about lost things being found are prompted by the mumbling and grumbling of religious professionals. You'll be familiar with them. Well, let's take a look. Luke 15, chapter, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And let's not just kind of skim over that point, okay? This is fascinating. The tax collectors and sinners are drawing near to Jesus. There's something about Jesus in what he's doing and what he's saying that people are attracted to him and his message. And they want to be around him, whether somebody invited them or whether they had just heard something and and took the initiative themselves. But it seems that often through the Gospels we read that tax collectors and sinners are the usual suspects, right? The irreligious that, that tend to somehow gravitate toward Jesus for one reason or another. Now, it's fascinating too because tax collectors and sinners are categorical, de- uh, uh, categorical uh, definitions of groups of people, right? Um, t- sinners, for example, is, is just kind of a catch-all phrase that, that really means those who have little if no moral or ceremonial obedience to the law or to things religious, right? To, to a particular moral code or ethical code. It's just, it's just the people who, you know, weren't going to not commit adultery. It's the people who weren't going to honor their father and mother. It's the people who, you know, you could list all kinds of things. This is the group. It's the sinners who really either paid no attention or may have come to church a couple times a year because that's what their family did, or, or maybe, you know, that was kind of their loose connection or association. But, but listen, it's, it's the categorical definition of just a group of people who who really have either no desire or at least no practice of following the Lord. And not only the sinners, but then tax collectors get their own designation as well. They get their own category apart from sinners, almost as if, you know, you kind of get the sense that, you know, well, they're, they're right up there, if not surpassing the sinners because of what they do. They, had, they, they were the traitors, right? They were the traitors nationally, right? Because they were collecting taxes on behalf of Rome, which was the occupying, you know, empire of Israel. They wanted their freedom and political independence, and yet they were being occupied because they've been conquered by Rome, and so there's this political tension, and with that came all kinds of religious tension, and so now the tax tax collectors are traitors to Israel because they're siding with Rome by collecting taxes, and not only that, they've lined their pockets and made their living and increasing wealth off of people who are paying taxes to a government they don't even we want to be paying taxes to, right? And so you have all this happening. And these tax collectors are sinners, and sinners are being drawn to Jesus. They, they find themselves in his company because they were drawing near to hear what he had to say. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, right? Clear contrast from tax collectors and sinners. They're the religious elites. They're the pious. They're the, they're the legalists, right? They're the, what we say, the men of the cloth, Right? Every once in a while, I'll say or do something, and Carolyn will look at me and say, Mitchell, you are a man of the cloth, she'll say. Right? Like, this is, okay? So, so, so this, is, this is kind of the, like, this is the idea. We have these two clear contrasting groups of people. And the Pharisees and the scribes, when they see the tax collectors and sinners gathering near to Jesus and how he receives them and, and the fact that they want to hear what he says, what do they do? They grumble. I can't believe that. Oh, da, 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 da. that's a no-no. Can you, oh, did you see what happened over there? Those kind of people showed up, and he's not calling them out. It's a little uncomfortable, right? At, at, at best. But they're grumbling about what's happening. And this is what they say among themselves. This man over here. Jesus receives sinners. He receives sinners. He gives them a welcome. He makes a space for them. And if that's not bad enough, he eats with them too. Okay. So, so this is a problem because not only does he welcome, but he keeps company. He has an association with 
these types of people. Now here's the assumption, okay? So, 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 so we can kind of poke at that a little bit, but, but man, here's the assumption. The assumption is if these people are gravitating toward Jesus, then it's a clear indication that Jesus must be morally compromised, right? You see that connection? If these people want to be with Jesus, he is clearly morally compromised. He can't be trusted. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, Jesus was labeled a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of sinners. And these were not kind of nice descriptions. Okay? This is what he was called because he drank wine and he sat around the table with people who lived ungodly lives, right? And he ate meals with them. And not only that, but it seems like he was even friendly toward them. That, that maybe even on some level, perhaps he even liked them. How could that even be? And so they begin to mumble about these things happening. And so this religious mumbling draws now Jesus to tell three short stories or three parables. And we know them as the lost sheep, right? The lost coin. And we call it the prodigal son, but I think we should call it the lost sons. Um, Those little headers in your Bible are are not original to the text Um, because there's two sons really that are lost in the parable of the lost son, the younger and the older, just in different ways, uh, which is fascinating, which is a story for another time. But now it says Jesus told them this parable, which again is a short story used to illustrate a deeper truth that's often unexplained, right? And until the disciples come and say, hey, we didn't really get what you said to the crowd. Could you kind of explain it to us? And Jesus usually does uh, kind of in the company of the disciples. But here Jesus not only tells the parable, but he also also explains the parable, and the reason is is because he's telling them why, the Pharisees and scribes, why he's sitting and eating with tax collectors and sinners, why he is spending time with them. And so he tells them this parable. He says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not go and leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one who is lost until he finds it? Now, if you've got 100 sheep, this is not kind of a backyard hobby farm, okay? We got, we got how many chickens we got now? <laughs> Six, right? We got five? Yeah, five. It's five? Yeah, five. Yes, five. Five chickens. A few have had unfortunate ends. Um, we have five chickens now, okay? That's a lot different from 100 chickens. See, I can't even keep track of five chickens. How am I supposed to keep track of 100 chickens? This is why we don't have 100 chickens. Uh, so we have five chickens at home. Jesus says, if you had 100 sheep, so this is not a hobby farm. This is an actual, like, this is quite a few sheep. But if you lost one, and how do you know you lost one? Because you're keeping track, right? You know where the sheep are. You're paying attention. You, you kind of keep them together in the huddle as a good shepherd would do. But he says, if one of them wanders off, sometimes at no fault of the shepherd, they've just kind of wandered away. It could be because they got scared by something that spooked them and they took off running, right? It could be because, you know, they got wounded somewhere along the way and and the pack moved on and they couldn't keep up. Or or maybe they just kind of followed the grass because that's what sheep do. We just follow the grass. Maybe One of those things could have happened. And what happens when one gets lost and separated, then it is in danger. A sheep on its own in the wild is not a good thing, right? A chicken out in the woods after dark is probably not gonna still be there in the morning. Okay, it's it's the same kind of thing. And Jesus says, look, if you had 100 sheep, but you lost one, wouldn't you leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one who was lost until he's found it? until he's found it, right? Um, You you say, look, the 99, they're going to be fine. They're probably going to be okay because they're together in their group of 99 sheep. And it's not like we're abandoning them completely. We're just going and search for the one that's lost. And so we're going to leave the 99 alone and he's going to go and search for until he finds that sheep. He's going to go over the hills and he's going to look under the rocks and he's going to look through the bushes until he finds that sheep. And then he says this, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Why does he lay it on his shoulders? To carry it back safely. And he rejoices because he is glad, he is happy to have found that one sheep that's wandered off. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and he says to them, rejoice with me because I found my sheep that was lost. 
He calls his friends. He texts them all. He posts it on Twitter and Facebook and Instagrams the little sheep on his shoulder, you know, and he's got, you know, and hey, everybody, check it out. The sheep was lost. It's found. He gets a whole bunch of likes, right? People thumbs up. Oh, and comments. Oh, so glad you found the sheep. We were wondering whatever happened to that sheep and, you know, glad it's okay and you got it back. And, you know, there's just this, there's this rejoicing that happens. And then Jesus explains the parable. Here's what he says. He says, just so, or in the same way, or just like the story that I've told about a sheep that I just made up for you. Listen, I tell you, there will be more joy, more joy. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. There will be more joy in heaven. This is not just on an individual scale. This is a cosmic scale. Right? Like, it's not just the shepherd who found the sheep who's excited and his few neighbors that he's texted. It is all of heaven is like, yes, let's throw a party. Somebody, you know, turn up the music, get the confetti cannons ready, right? Light the candles, let's get the, you know, every, get some good food. Like, we are throwing a party. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner, one person who has lost their way and wandered off from the Lord who repents. And the word repent, you know, we often associate, well, repent means to get down on your knees and weep bitterly and, and all the rest. That can be connected to it. But to repent simply means to change your thinking, to reconsider a particular pattern of thought, to reconsider something that you held to be true, and now to look at something different and to be convinced of that, that you can change your mind from one thing to another. And repentance means changing your mind from one direction and one way toward another way. And in this context, it is looking toward heaven. It is turning away from the things that, that do not bring us you know, under um, the, the kind of umbrella of following Jesus. It's, it's the things that would actually lead us away to the life, joy, all the things that come from following Jesus. And it means turning away from that toward trusting and following him again. And one sinner who repents of their sin and of their wandering and of their bad behavior or their immoral action or the thing that they did that they shouldn't have done where they had disregarded and dishonored the Lord. One sinner who repents, right? There is more joy in in heaven when that happens, then what? Nine in a group of 99 other people who are just doing the right thing. 99 righteous persons who have nothing to repent of in this moment. Now, he's not saying here that the Pharisees and scribes don't need repentance. He's not saying that they're righteous and, and their righteousness is, you know, that's, that's not the point of his parable. What he's saying is that for those who trust and follow, Right? There's not the re same rejoicing in heaven over the one who's, who's headed in a different direction and, and changes their thinking and gets picked up and brought home. There's rejoicing in heaven when that happens. You see, the assumption of the Pharisees in this moment is that heaven is celebrating them. The assumption in the moment is that the Pharisees, for the Pharisees, is that heaven is celebrating their righteousness and their goodness, which led them to be critical now of the company that Jesus kept. But Jesus says there's more joy in heaven over a sinner who turns to God, which, by the way, is the reason he came. Now, this parable itself about sheep and shepherds is not totally in isolation. In fact, if you read through the Old Testament, which the Pharisees and scribes should have been familiar with, you will find in Ezekiel chapter 34 that at this point in history of Ezekiel's day, that Israel's shepherds had been self-centered, that, that they'd only been feeding themselves and not caring for the sheep. And it's part of the reason why they've been taken off into exile in Babylon. And what Ezekiel says is, is there's a day coming when the Lord himself will be their shepherd. Not only that, but in Isaiah 53, which many of us will be familiar with these words, was to say, we all, like sheep, have done what? We've wandered off. Anybody here, right, not done that? Anybody want to admit? Yeah, I, I've wandered. I, I've, listen, I, I've taken the detour. I followed the grass, right? I just ate what was in front of me. And, and, then, and then one minute I look up, and I'm no longer with the crowd, 
I'm no longer with the group. I've just kind of wandered off into my own thing and now I'm in danger and now I'm in trouble. And, and what we all like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus himself arrives on the shore of the lake and he looks up and he looks out to the crowd and he sees them with great compassion. Why? Because they are like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus in John 10 verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. And I am the good shepherd, not only the good shepherd, but I am the good shepherd who does what? Who lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Now here's what Jesus doesn't say happens in the parable. He doesn't say that when the one got lost, hopefully he'll turn up. You know, hopefully he'll come back. Hopefully he'll find his way. You know, eventually, he'll, he'll, that sheep will, or she or whichever it is, is going to come back to the fold. We'll just hold out hope that someday that'll happen. He, he doesn't look out at the 99 sheep and say, well, at least we got 99 still. We'll hunker down. Oh, a few more wander. Well, we've still got 97, right? Until someday, well, we've still got 10 left. We're the 10 faithful sheep who've never left the flock, right? Like, he doesn't say any of those things. The other thing is, is that when the shepherd gets to the sheep, here's what he doesn't do. He doesn't pull out a staff and just give it a good whack. Say, what in the world were you thinking wandering off by yourself? He doesn't give the sheep a big lecture, probably because the sheep's not going to talk back to him. You know, that's probably part of it. But, but he doesn't, but you've done that. You've lectured inanimate objects before, so don't think that's too far-fetched, okay? Uh, right? So, so he doesn't look at the sheep and go, you stupid sheep. Can I say that in church? Like, you, sh- you sheep, like, what is your problem? What are you doing? I told you, and I told you, and now this is what's happened, and I told you this was going to happen, and if you did this, and if you did that, and I can't believe, and now you're caught in a thicket. Look where you've ended up. And man, like, figure it out and walk away. Doesn't do that either. He doesn't pull the sheep out of the thicket and then chase it down and run it off a cliff. Like, he doesn't do any of those things. What does he do? picks it up, puts it on his shoulders. That doesn't mean they don't have the conversation at some point, but in that moment, does the sheep need a lecture? In the moment, does the sheep need a good whack? In the moment, what does the sheep need? In the moment, the sheep needs the compassion and the mercy and the care of the shepherd who's gonna bring him back to the fold. That's what he needs. And this is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. It is a search and rescue mission of God. And he comes into this world to seek and to save what is lost. And if he's gonna seek and save what's lost, if he's gonna be the great physician who's gonna heal the ones who are sick, then he has to be with the ones who are sick. He has to go in search of the ones who are lost. And he says, I've come first for the lost sheep of Israel. That's where I've come for. And then the mission expands to the Gentile world and to the rest of humanity, which now includes us, right? And so, so, so this whole idea is, is that Jesus comes to seek and to save, and he comes into this world and he lays down his life for the sheep. He bears our sorrows. He is a man of sorrows who, who, who takes on himself the transgression, the iniquity, the sin of all of us, who bears all of that on the cross of Calvary, who lays down his life, and through his death and resurrection and faith in Christ, we, right, through repentance of sin, of turning to the Lord, what do we see? We have this invitation of Jesus to find life in him. Because in all of our wanderings, what we will end up discovering is they don't bring us the satisfaction and joy that we thought they would. And Jesus says there is a welcome for the one sinner who repents and turns back to the Lord, and there will be great rejoicing in heaven. Now, this is what Jesus has come to do. Like, that's the point of the parable. He is the good shepherd who's come to rescue the sheep. Now, now I want to make a jump for us because, yes, it's all found in Christ and what he's in. And as he's telling this parable, this is happening in real time. Christ has come for the sheep. Like, this is, this is how it's all playing out. But I want to make the jump now because for us as a church in the 21st century, in this cultural moment that we find ourselves in, we too have been given the responsibility of bringing the good news to other people. Have we not? Is that not what Christ has called us to do? To be bearers of good news, right? That, that is the mission we have been given. 
right? And so what happens is where we carry that responsibility to bring the good news to other people, that's going to require from us intention and attention, that we are intentional about keeping track, about going after, of looking for, that we are going to make the effort, right? It doesn't just happen uh, by accident, right? It has to be on purpose. That's the intention. And it requires that we give attention to the people that we are in search of. In fact, in James chapter 5, at the very end of this letter of James, here's what he says. He says, my brothers, and by consequence of sisters as well for all of us, if anyone among you does what? wanders from the truth, right? And there could be a lot of reasons why. If any of you wanders from the truth and someone brings him, what? Back. And someone brings him back. Because what does that take? It takes intention and attention, to bring them back. If someone brings him back, what, does, what happens? What, what does that look like? Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. It is a cause for celebration. And so, so listen, here's, I'm going to wrap this up. This is a picture of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It is a glorious celebratory scene. Is it not? Like, like when you stop to think about your own wandering and your own failures and the times you got it wrong and your loud mouth and, and your poor decision, right? And all of the, right? And myself included, I say your, but pejoratively all of our, right? Those things, like in all of our sinning and our wandering and our disobedience, in all of that to know the mercy and grace of God that his son would step into this world to bring us back? Right? Like this is a, like, yes, praise the Lord, right? Like I know it's 11, 15 and you 20 almost and we've been here a while, but like this is, this is the good news story. This is what Christ has done for us and he has rescued us and he gives us the invitation. You are welcome back. Trust and follow me. You are welcome back. I'm bringing you home. Man, this is, this is such a good news story, but now for us who found our space and our place in the kingdom of God with the gifts God has given us and the commission he's called us to and the joy of the Lord that, that is the fullness of our lives in all of that, the question becomes then when someone wanders off. When some, someone wanders off. And listen, in the last year and a half or better, there's been all kinds of reasons for people to wander off. There's all, been all kinds of reasons for people to disattach, to disassociate, to pull back from, to drift away, to follow the grass. There's all kinds of reasons why somebody may have wandered off. So I want to ask the question for all of us, who's your one? Who's your one? Who, who's the one sheep that you've noticed is no longer with the flock? For one reason or another, it could be anything. But who's the one sheep that you are going to leave the 99 for to head in their direction? Because at some point, I, I would suggest this to us, that at some point you and I were someone else's one. You and I were someone else's one. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a pastor, maybe it was a youth leader, maybe it was a friend, maybe it was a coworker, maybe it was a neighbor, right? But, but somebody cared enough about you that they would go and search and give you by intention and attention, right? That they would pray for, that they would care for, that they would share their life with, and they would point you to Jesus. Again, let's not confuse it because Jesus is still the rescuer of the sheep, Right? But, but as James would say, if anyone notices somebody's wandered off and you go and you bring them back, right? It's the same example. If you go and bring them back, what have you done? You've saved their soul from death and you've covered a multiple, you, you've covered over a multiple, uh, multiple sins. 
happens. And we, uh, you know, in some ways have come through a big part of, uh, we still have a lot ahead, but there's been a crazy season of life. Every, the whole world's been mixed up and torn around and upside down, and we don't know what weighs up some days other than others. Man, and I'm not immune to that. Like, I, I'm like here one day and here the other day and the other day and way over there. And like, sometimes I'm just like, ah, I, I have no idea what's next. I don't know what, what can I do? How can I be helpful? What is the best way forward? How do we figure this out? What, and, and sometimes I don't have all the answers, right? But, but the thing is, is what have we been called to? We've been called to trust and follow Jesus. So in the midst of all the crazy, you know, what, what is the gravitational pull? Well, the gravitational pull for some of us during this time is to kind of huddle together and hunker down and do the important thing, right? And, and then if we can just get back together and if we can get the right people together and, you know, whoever's going to come back, we'll just start with that and we'll go with that, which, which isn't a bad starting point. But here's, here's my question. We can't, or my point, that you can't lose sight of some of the th- people who have wandered off in the midst of it because if all we're trying to do is pull it all back together and whoever's with us let's go I mean yeah there's a there's a great place for starting with that but man there there, there's got to be the people along the way that's like where, where are they who's your one who's your one that you give by intention and attention your time to the one person that you will pray regularly for Right? That you will pick up your phone at some point in the next week or two and send a text or a phone call or say, hey, let's have coffee, uh, give you my attention, let's, let's do supper together, right? We can cook a barbecue on my back porch, come on over and we'll, we'll sit down and we'll have a chat and you, know, you trust the Holy Spirit in the process of that. And, and listen, it's not just come back to church, but like how's things with your soul? How's things with your spirit? How's things with your relationship with God? Is your soul adrift somewhere, right? Have you, have you kind of been following the grass somewhere? Did you get wounded somewhere along the way? Man, because let me help you bandage that up. Let me give you a good meal, right? Let me, let, let me do what I can to help pull you back in. Because as Jesus said, the harvest is ready and the workers are few. But what have we been called to do? We've been called to beg God. God, send, send people. We're going to send people out to fulfill the mission you've called us to, to, to beg God, but then ourselves be going. Because in the very next verse, after he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field, what's the very next thing Jesus does? He says, I am sending you. You pray, and then you go. And this, I love this about this whole parable is that yes, Jesus is the good shepherd of the sheep. It's only through him that we find our way back into relationship restored with God. Absolutely 100%. But he has also sent us out now, right? On mission to participate in what he has called us to do, to leave the 99 and go after the one. And that's going to take all of us, and it's going to take intention, it's going to take attention. Sometimes the result or the outcome may not be what we hope or want or pray for, right? But but we've got to put in the work to do it. And as we roll into this fall season and what's next, we're going to be starting some things up again over the next few weeks, and we're going to be getting things together, and we've got some plans for to kind of get back into some other regular rhythms of the church that we've missed for so long. You know, we're, we're hoping and expectant that we're going to be able to do that soon, but, but listen, in the time being, as we kind of roll into that particularly, who is the one that you are going to pick up the phone for, that you leave the 99 for, to do your part in pulling them back in. Let's give thanks to God. Father, we thank you that, that you left the 99 to chase us down. We thank you that in all of our wanderings and our failures and our sin and our brokenness and poor decisions for all the spaces and places that we got it wrong, that, that we are the tax collector and the sinner, God, you sent your son into this world to welcome, to pull back, to lay down his life for the sheep. And you were glad to enter into the mess of our story and to take our feet, as the psalmist says, out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and to set our feet on a rock, and you've given us a new song. 
I gotta pray that that would be true for us, that as we found the joy of the Lord, maybe for the person today who needs to take that first step to repent of their sin, to trust Jesus who died for the sin, was buried, rose again, and was seen, that you gotta take that first step and in, in, in a whole life of trust and obedience, gotta pray that that first step would be taken today. But God, too, for those of us who have taken that step, I pray that, that you would stir up in us that you would put on our hearts the name of that one person that we need to be praying for, that we need to be seeking out, um, that, that we can invite back into relationship with you. I pray we'd be faithful in doing so. And as we do, we would see lives changed because of the good news of Jesus, in whose name we pray.